Hey, what's up, bros and hoes? <laughs> no. Why? What's wrong with that? Hey, what's up, bros and hoes? Brad the Guitologist here. <laughs> Today, we're gonna huff some asbestos. <laughs> so, uh, my estranged wife is visiting. She's in the other room saying, uh, no, no, you're in your 40s. You can't say that. <laughs> I think I just did. You don't own me. Lady. All right, so this is a uh, 19, I think a 58 Fender uh, Champ. Uh, you guys probably saw the, the other Champ I had on the, the channel recently. Uh, I think that one was a 62. But you can see how kind of just nasty that is. Also, the handle's in pretty bad shape. I've done some research since getting this because I was wanting to see if I could fix this handle. They do make some stuff for leather that is kind of like a bonding agent that you can soak this in. Um, I don't know how effective that would be and it's also very expensive. So I'm thinking, I'm debating whether or not to order some of that to maybe try to soak this handle because I think it would be instructive for other Fender amp owners if they have handles that are in this kind of shape. I don't know if you could see exactly what's going on with this, but yeah, you can see how cracked it is here and how delaminated it's uh, becoming right there and then of course on this end you have got some uh, lack of uh, some loss of the top lamination right here on the leather and it's just it's coming apart in the middle right here as well you can see it's becoming delaminated a part of me thinks I could probably start producing these because they're I mean all this is is, is a bunch of stacks of leather that are sewed together but you would have to have a really good leather machine to make this because there's I can count one two three four it looks like five laminations am I right one two three four. yeah there's like five laminations of leather on this um, and usually these fail right here where this one is starting to fail but it would be interesting and instructive if I could fix this because I'm sure there are a lot of champ owners and other fender amp owners who would like to be able to fix their leather handle that is just clinging on for dear life like this one is. Um, but I just don't know how effective it would be. Um, and that, like I said, that stuff that you can soak it in is kind of expensive. So we might not do that, but we might, who knows. I already have the back door off of this thing. Like I said, this has the asbestos backing on it. And this one is starting to get a little bit of rough roughness on this edge so I don't want to go snorting it or anything like that but I mean the dangers of asbestos is really overplayed as long as it doesn't become like uh, uh, airborne or as long as I don't sit here and rough it up and you know just sprinkle a bunch into the air and huff it day in and day out it's probably not a big deal uh, just about anything could be a carcinogen even even just sawdust regular sawdust that you know from a sawmill um, or a workshop can be carcinogenic if you breathe enough of it day in and day out. So that's my thoughts on that. But again, I'm no scientist, but I would like to see the data. I insist upon actual data. I'm one of those stubborn assholes. Uh, so anyway, we're going to get into this. Uh, you can see here that uh, we've got all the original stuff in this. This has got the yellow Astron capacitors still. <laughs> Uh, these don't hold up particularly well. Uh, I think the other one that I showed on the channel had the blue uh, mica mold capacitors, which do hold up very well, and those were good in that amplifier, but I suspect that these are not going to be good and, and are going to be leaky to some extent, as these mostly are. Uh, you can see we've got blowouts on all of these capacitors here. Uh, these have an air vent in them, uh, but by the time it gets blown out, beyond this outer kind of rubbery uh, layer, uh, you know that the, the the capacitor is no longer good for sure. So that's no longer good, this one and this one. This one's actually starting to leak some material, some electrolyte material. So for sure that one's not good and uh, you know, the, these need to go. Um, we're gonna restuff these. I'm not gonna take too many pains to restuff them where you can't tell that it's not restuff because that's not the goal here the goal is not to fool anybody the goal is to just make it look somewhat original when you open the amp up with as little uh, intrusiveness as possible so yeah let's go ahead and do that we also have to obviously replace the power cord it's pretty dirty inside of here as well you can see right there the little sticker that says loopy on it 
I think I think she was a little Mexican American lady. She did a lot of uh, work in in the Fender factory back in the day, and you see her name on a lot of chassis and stuff. She apparently was a really good worker and uh, was there for quite a long time. The back door on this is interesting. I'm not sure what's going on with this, if I'm honest. But this back door here, you can see, it comes down to this point. Um, but we're missing something. It looks like we're missing maybe a second back door, or maybe this this back door has been cut down, perhaps. But something used to extend up to here. You can see the difference in in colors. So I don't know. Something's missing right there. So is it a second back? Somebody let me know in the comments. Was there supposed to be a second back door right here on some of these champs? Because there definitely was something there for a long time. <laughs> But anyway, uh, let's get to this thing. This should be uh, fun. If nothing else, it should be fun to see how good we can clean up uh, that chassis right there and make it look. Well, come on inside, you all. We're fixing to have a ball. Go ahead and pull the tubes. It feels like maybe that sockets might need to be retentioned a little bit. <sighs> oh, now that's a shame and a nice old American amp. Look at that. It's a run-of-the-mill Chinese 12A7. We could probably do a little bit better than that. Okay, while the chassis is still in this, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, desolder the power cord. I couldn't tell you for sure whether this is the original cord or not, but this looks like it's probably a replacement. This looks like something that would have come off of uh, maybe a vacuum cleaner. It's actually adhered to some of the, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, the tweed on that side. I think I might have said 58 before, it's 59. See right there, 606, 9, 25, that's 1959, 25th week. That's the original uh, Schumacher. That I couldn't tell you, really couldn't tell you whether it's original or not, probably is. I think it's interesting how they have uh, multiple screw holes, so if they wanted to use bigger transformers, they could, I suppose. That's what it looks like they're doing right there. Not sure what these would have been, though. Okay, I'm gonna wire this the way I always wire these, with the hot going directly to the fuse first. Um, I've explained all this before, the reason I do it this way. There are some other techs who do it different ways, and I'm not saying they're necessarily doing it wrong. I'm just saying I'm doing it the way that's most often recommended. I'm doing it the way it's technically supposed to be done. Okay, we're gonna clip out the death cap. The death cap is on a ground terminal we're gonna pop that ground terminal out of there and move it uh, close to where the cord exits out of the amp and hindsight 2020 I probably should have done that first but oh well uh, it feels like it's gotten under the lip of that chassis damn it come on They put that on before they put the transformer on. So, yeah, I have to get another terminal to put down here for the ground. Or I'll just, um, I'll get my Big Bertha soldering iron out and I'll solder it directly over here. So here's Big Bertha. We haven't seen her in a while. 
but we're gonna put her in a service to get this uh, ground wire on the chassis over here. And we're gonna enjoy a nice biscotti biscuit with a cup of coffee, or cappuccino rather. It's starting to warm up. This thing is so big, it takes a while to warm it up. I have uh, another one a uh, fan of the channel sent in. This is uh, this one's also 100 watts. And this one has a very, very big head on it. And the reason I'm not using it is because I already have a couple wires here I need to deal with. So I don't want the tip to be that big. It's kind of in the way, but I just need to focus my uh, energy in a smaller area. So this one is a Link, made in Boston, Massachusetts. This, and this one is a Hexacon. This one was made in New Jersey. At one time, I bought a large lot of um, stuff that had belonged to a tech. And it had just a bunch of old test equipment, old wires, tubes. I mean, you name it. It had tons of stuff. Down. I think I got this in with all that stuff. And really, that's the way to buy stuff anymore. Try to get stuff at estate sales. You can often come across a horde of things that you're going to pay a lot less for than if you went out and bought it piecemeal. You know, one of the things I can think of that really is a lot cheaper if you go that route is like hardware. The prices on all that stuff have give, what, gone way up in the past few years. It's just the scarcity of resources, man. There's, you know, too few resources and too many people and uh, something's got to give. All right, Big Bertha, don't fail me now. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to turn this chassis. I can't, can't get a good purchase on the chassis. It keeps moving around on me. Let's come at it from this way. I think this thing is still warming up. Is Bertha gonna? I think there we got her. I think. That's gonna do it. That's gonna do it. We got her. All right. So there's our ground. Our death cap is removed. Now we're gonna desolder the wire that's going to the transformer on the other side of the fuse holder here because that has to be soldered directly to the neutral uh, so that will go to the white and I always like to come back on these connections and add enough solder that it, it just covers everything over um, I like to have a really nice good looking round thick solder connection on this kind of stuff not enough that it blobs up and falls off but enough that it uh, it will hold robustly. Right. See what I mean? Pretty good looking solder joint there. All right, now what we have to do is um, come from here. So this is our hot wire coming in. So this is gonna go through the fuse. We'll come from the other side of the fuse <clears throat> over to the switch. Then it'll go through the switch. When the switch is in the on position, it will allow the voltage to come to this point and go through the transformer and then back out. So this is the out of the transformer and we're gonna put that to the neutral right there like that so we'll have a, a circuit. And I'm gonna cut down the white wire just a little bit here. I don't need that quite that much of it. Yep. Bastard. Hate when that happens. Yeah, I'm not very I'm not happy with that. Alright, I'm just gonna get another piece of wire.
There we go. That's much better. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, now let's get our neutral wire on there. I gotta be careful with this. I shouldn't have cut that much of that off, but oh well. Okay, so there is our new power cord wired in. The hot wire comes in to the tip right here of the fuse holder. And incidentally, the fuse, I just pulled it and it's a three amp, so I'm gonna have to change it. It should be a two amp instead, uh, slow blow. So we'll change that in a little bit. But for now, just for demonstration purposes, I wanna show you uh, what's going on here. So uh, some other, um, Techs will do this a different way. So they'll go and I used to do it this way as well Go to the switch with the hot wire first That way when the switch is in the off position, it's going nowhere else in the amplifier Well, the problem with that is if you were to open up one of these switches uh, In particular the ones that are on the back of a pot like this you can see how close these terminals are right here Look at look at this terminal for instance Okay, look at both of these terminals you see this terminal right here? So that terminal is hot. And see this little tab right here? Uh, less than, I don't know, what is that? A millimeter or less away? Um, that's ground. That's going to the chassis right there. You know? Uh, and also over here. And in, if you were to open this up, take these tabs off and open the back of this up, you would see how this switch is constructed. There is a, um, it's a rotary thing inside that, um, it, it's hard to describe, you just have to see it. But there are ways that that could possibly fail and bend and get up against the outer uh, casing. The only thing separating that from this these outer casings, in most cases in an amp this old, are a little thin wafer of this material. I don't even know what this is, it's some kind of a fiberboard or something, uh, this stuff right here. And there's a there should be a thin wafer of it on the inside as well and if that gets worn through just one little short is all it takes and and you've got hot 120 120 on the chassis now in this case with it grounded as it is right here with a three prong cord on it it's probably it's going to overload the circuit in your house or wherever you are, if it's wired properly, it's, it should overload that immediately and uh, trip the breaker in the house or office or venue or wherever you got this thing, studio. It should trip the breaker if everything's wired properly. But maybe it's not wired properly and it might not. So I like to go through the fuse first because the fuse is gonna offer you some protection. Uncle Doug does it going to the switch first and he has, you know, he has some good arguments for it, and I can't necessarily um, blame him for his arguments. Um, you know, I've, like I said, I've, I've harbored the same thoughts myself in the past, and I just decided to do it a different way. But if you look here, the argument that he has is that, okay, well, there might be a situation where you leave the amp plugged in, and you blew a fuse, and you're gonna take the fuse out, okay? Well, these fuse holders are safety fuse holders. It doesn't matter what kind of tip. There are different tips that you can have on these, but all of them are safety fuse holders. See the distance from, from this side of the fuse to this side of the fuse? The tip is only right here at the bottom. So if you see a little sleeve of metal right here at the top, 
of this fuse holder, that's never going to be hot unless you actually have a good fuse in this thing. The fuse is bridging that gap. And look at this. You can't, there's no situation where a child could put her finger down in there um, and get to the hot lead, which is way down inside of here. Um, you can't really see it, but I don't know. Maybe you can. I don't know. But the hot lead is so far down in there, you're you're not going to be touching that, okay? Um, this little sleeve up here at the top is the is the secondary side, is this this lead over here. So these are, you know, the argument that there's going to be a situation where you're going to take the fuse out to check it, and you're gonna you're gonna somehow touch this metal right there, that little sleeve of metal, while this. Is touch while the other end of it is touching down inside. Now look, you can see this move. Watch this end right here. You can see it move as soon as this touches. Watch. I'm going to insert it. Okay. Now watch this end. Keep watching. It touches right there. Right there. You see it? Now look. There's no way I could get any portion of my finger up under there to touch metal. It's just not going to happen. So what do you think the likelihood is of being able to electrocute yourself by reaching up under there with a finger when, in the, when you're in the act of, of checking the fuse, for instance, with the thing plugged in? It just, it's not going to happen. These are safety fuses for uh, fuse holders for a reason. So um, that kind of, to, in my mind, it nullifies the argument that um, you know Uncle Doug makes. And this is not a, this is not, believe me, uh, uh, an indictment of Uncle Doug or his methods or anything like that. He has a different way of doing it, and that's I think that's fine. There are, again, there are arguments for both ways, but I do it this way um, because I think that that the argument that he has that somebody could electrocute themselves on the fuse holder um, is is kind of nullified by the fact that these are safety fuse holders, and that just isn't going to happen. I don't believe. I don't think it's even possible to, to do it. Here, look, look how close that is right there right there so i don't know you get here's look at this see this little stray uh bit of solder that was right there you get a stray bit of solder see these little stray bits right here from the manufacturing process or it might have been from a second ago whenever i uh desoldered this but but even even a little stray bit like that gets lodged up in here or something after the amp's been transported or who knows i you know i'm just speculating things can happen this can short it can short internally uh, i know it it's not it's not a usual failure point um and it's exceptionally rare i'm sure i've never had it happen and i agree with uncle doug on that one i've never seen it happen but like i said this is not an indictment of uncle doug or his methods i think uncle doug in fact is probably the best uh, uh amplifier guy on youtube and uh you know i, I would i would choose to watch his show over my own even uh you know if i was if i were you guys so i mean this again uh, i look up to uncle doug um i consider him uh, uh you know uh, sort of a mentor in what i'm doing here so um it's not an indictment on him or his methods or anyone else for that matter it's just i think that this is the better way of doing it so anyway in defense of the way i do it that's my argument. Uh, but let's go ahead and change that 3 amp to a 2 amp, and then we will uh, we'll start stuffing some caps.
Okay, we're back with this uh, with this amp. I have restuffed all these capacitors. The Sprague 20 microfarad capacitor fits inside of the 16 housing pretty much like a glove. The same can be said for the F and T 10 microfarad capacitor. It fits right inside the 8 microfarad sleeve like a glove and really there's no adhesive or anything necessary to keep the thing inside of it now these are a little bit of an exception um, i had to cut some pieces of card you can see here i've got some basically some cardboard it's very thin cardboard with some uh with some tape backing it and i cut out some circles that i could put on the ends of this and basically just glued them in on the ends as you can see right there it you know, I mean, unless you're really looking for it, you don't notice it. You do notice this one. I'm not sure how that happened. I, I don't think I did that, or did I? I must have gotten up on it when I uh, when I changed that resistor right there. I did find a couple of resistors. Uh, this one here and this one down in here. This is the bias resistor for the output. Uh, it was pretty well charred. I don't know if you're going to be able to tell it. On camera but well maybe you can it's I wouldn't say charred but it's uh, definitely been cooked and you can kind of see the discoloration it's turning black there but replace that one because it had drifted I don't know probably about 30% high that's 470 and it was up a, it was above 600 ohms when I tested it so that needed to go it's way out of spec uh, and this one this first dropping resistor in the power supply it, it had drifted uh, well above 10% so I went ahead and replaced it with a metal resistor that will be um, it will resist driftage in the future driftage if that's even a word it will resist that in the future and uh, also they're flame proof so uh, if we do have an overload in this this resistor won't go up in flames uh, this resistor tested actually perfect um, I was kind of surprised so and I was on the fence about replacing it anyway with um, a metal film resistor uh, right there as a dropping resistor it would make sense since the value was dead on uh, I, I didn't bother the rest of these values were were pretty much dead on or with or under 10% uh, tolerance so I did not change those I'm gonna fire the amp up I'm gonna test these uh, capacitors in the circuit my guess is they're not th these are probably going to be leaky uh, they usually are um, I went ahead and crimped the RCA jack a little bit to tension it uh, what you can do is come in here and clean them this is for the output by the way you clean them and then uh, you can crimp them just a little bit so basically just barely Kind of squeeze on it and that's just going to give it a little more purchase when you plug in the uh, the jack it'll have a little bit more there behind it cleaned all the tube sockets cleaned the control uh clean the input jacks and we're ready to stick another actually i'm going to clean the inside of this uh cabinet just a little bit it's a little bit filthy got some just junk up i'm gonna take it outside and probably brush it out a little bit uh just to get it as clean as I can you know we're not trying to spick and span it or anything we're just trying to clean all the cobwebs out of it okay here we go the uh, chassis is reinstalled we're gonna dial it up on the variac I may as well move it over so you can see the variac okay we are drawing a little bit of wattage so we know somebody's home <laughs> okay we're gonna measure the DC voltage on uh, both sides of these capacitors so we're gonna come to uh, this side first, which was where the high voltage should be, 129 volts right there. Now on the other side, there should be almost zero. And it's not bad. I mean, we're only at a half a volt, but that's with only 74 volts on the input. So that's not as high as it could be. Uh, it sh it's probably going to be a little leakier than that. There's 116 volts on that side. And if we go up here to the other side of it, 0.1 volts is not bad, but let's go ahead and dial it on up. You know, I don't want to replace those unless I have to, but you know, the thing about those is they're, it's very easy to be skeptical of those because I've seen so many bad ones in the past. Okay, there's 110 volts. We'll go on up to about 117 or so, which is about what the voltage is after uh, the amp draws down a little bit. So on one side of that, we have 179 volts. 
on the other side it's probably gonna be a little higher than what it was so we got one volt positive right there so we are a little bit leaky 151 right there and on the other side of it we've got 0.2 volts so it's not it's not terribly leaky but it is leaky and the thing is if you leave those in there they're not going to get better over time they're only going to get worse and as they get worse uh, they will continue to leak more and more DC onto the uh, grids of the 12AX7 and the output tube as well and uh, it just makes things not good because you can start to uh, burn up your tubes that way yeah it's just it's not a good state of affairs to leave bad components in an amplifier like that so I think the thing to do is to replace those and what we are going to replace those with we're going to put some Sozo next gen uh, blue capacitors in there but this one right here I would probably want to replace regardless being up over a volt positive it's just not good um, to leave them like that like I said they will continue to fail over time and it's not like uh, some of the modern capacitors that you see where they have um, it has it's self-healing uh, where if there are problems later on where the capacitor will actually heal itself uh, these are not these are these old school astrons and they're not good capacitors guys I don't care what anybody says they're just not it's not gonna make your amp sound better it's not gonna make it sound original the capacitor if you're keeping the type of capacitor the same, it's you're not going to notice a difference in tone. Uh, the only difference in tone you'll notice is the difference of the amp running the way it's supposed to after installing a good capacitor. Here's one way you can tell that something's not right is... I don't know if you can hear that right there. Now, some of that might be... Um, might be a scratchy pot I've already cleaned this pot but let me clean it again just to make sure we don't have anything like that going on Ooh, we got a that's a microphonic tube you hear that it's not that it's gonna be that preamp tube bet you it's usually what that signifies a microphonic tube you hear that though okay that, that's interesting uh I'm gonna prod around a little bit. It might, it might actually be one of these. that capacitor right there. Look at that. You hear that? Listen. You hear how microphonic that capacitor is? That's a microphonic capacitor right there. Ooh. You hear that? Okay, well that that's certainly interesting. We're gonna um, we're gonna replace both of these anyway. We'll see if that goes away. But I can hear some sounds like a dirty pot, and it's not real bad, but it's consistent with what I would expect if we had uh, DC bleeding over onto this pot. Listen to that. Yeah, that's, that's a microphonic component for sure. There, you hear that? And it very easily could be that still that tube or the output tube. But it sounds like... It sounds like it might be a microphonic cap or a failing cap. I don't know. Let's go ahead and replace those caps regardless. So let's go ahead and pull those both out of there. You know, there is probably, I brainstormed about this for a good long while. There's probably a way to drill these. You could probably clip these uh, capacitors at each end and uh, drill them out. It would be easiest probably to do that with a, um, a drill press, which I do not have. 
I'm sure it could be done and you could restuff those capacitors, but the new Sozos that I want to put in there, they wouldn't fit inside of it anyway. And it just, I think it would be a, uh, I think it'd just be a waste of time to try to restuff that capacitor. The other way you could do it is uh, you could come in here and make an incision along the side either with a scalpel or a Dremel tool, something like that, you know, and cut one side of it. And then you can come over and cut the other side down the seam. Um, you'd want to get somewhere where you weren't cutting across the, um, the lettering or something, you know, if you wanted it to look good. Um, but you could just do it right on the seam as well. There's a seam here anyway. You could just uh, cut that seam open and then restuff it and then glue it back together. That's possible as well. You know, for somebody who wants to do that. But in this case, I just don't think it's worth it. I think it's better just to be upfront and honest about what capacitors are in here so no one ever in the future is getting fooled. I mean, you can obviously tell that these have been restuffed if you look at them uh, for more than a second. But, you know, on a casual glance, it looks, you know, fairly original. So, I mean, that's kind of the goal there is not to fool anybody. I'm going to use the old cap as kind of a template for where to cut. Same thing. These Sozos, they're also marked with a an outer foil marking. Uh, the old ones also have the outer foil marking. I mean, I'll be honest with you, it's it's not that important. Um, it's really not because new caps generally are a lot smaller than old caps anyway. And uh, in an amp like this, with no more gain than this has, it's not going to be critical. In some circuits, it could be critical though. Um, Mostly uh, radio applications, it will definitely be critical to, to mark the foil correctly. But in an amplifier like this, it's not going to be as critical as, as some people make out. It's just not. But the marking is there, so you may as well abide by it. Okay, so there are the new Sozo caps installed. A little bit more solder on those joints. Okay, so there are those installed. Let's uh, let's do that test again and see if there's any difference. And there's no whooshing whatsoever on that pot now. There's no crackling, no whooshing. And if we measure across that again with uh, our multimeter, we're gonna find that we're in much better shape, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna see our high voltage here once again. There's 184 volts on this side. We've got 185 volts on that side of that one. Now let's go to the other side. Look at that, almost nothing at all. 0, 0.00 something, but barely anything at all. And that was one whole volt before. It was one point something odd volts which is not good. That one 184 on that side, and we've got, again, 0, 0, .00 and then something else. It's just too, uh, too small for the meter to really read. Okay, we do still have some chirping when we tap this. So we have something still that is, that is microphonic. And I believe it's that tube right there. Yep. Yep, that tube is microphonic. So I tap on the output tube and nothing really happening there. And a little bit of tapping like this, I mean, some people are going to freak out because I'm tapping the tube. It's it, Man, tubes are not as fragile as you think they are. If a tube is, is going to fail, it's usually going to fail within the first little bit. It's not going to... It's not gonna last for 40 years usually and then fail because of a little bit of tapping like this. You know, it's not like I'm whacking it with a hammer either. You know, a little bit of tapping is gonna tell you 
whether you've got microphonics on the tube and this one is definitely microphonic and you can even hear it just from, like I said from tapping up here it's not nearly as bad as it was though so we we had a microphonic as well as leaky capacitor one of these was sure for sure microphonic and leaky the other one was uh, was leaky to an extent and was also perhaps a little bit microphonic we found out that's actually that's actually not bad I mean you could roll with that right there it's not terribly microphonic but it is a little bit microphonic uh, I might call the customer and see what he wants to do um, if he wants a nicer tube in there anyway it might be worth his while to go ahead and get you know an RCA or a GE or an old Sylvania or something to put in uh, this spot instead of this Chinese tube considering it's microphonic anyway it would be a, a worthy investment it's going to raise the value of the amp for sure um, for somebody who's going to buy it they'd much rather see an old rca or something like that or old ge than they would uh this you know new chinese tube that's kind of a turn off when you're buying a i think these are going for what 2500 or something now to three thousand dollars a lot of times i think for a 59 this would probably fetch upward of three grand you know especially now that it's been um, fully serviced but this just goes to show you know uh, even if the capacitors like this were working technically like you, you know you could get sound out of the amplifier it's not operating the way it's supposed to you know you've got DC leaking onto the potentiometer which is going to ruin the potentiometer over time most likely a lot of times it can cause burn spots on the pot and that's your original pot. I would much rather replace a couple of caps than have to than burn my original pot that has the switch on the back of it, like this one. You have to replace that. That would be that would be um, probably a bigger hit to the value of the amp than than a couple of caps that everybody expects to be bad anyway. So, you know, it, it's you've got to think about this kind of stuff and um, just be smart about it. But you can see right here. I mean, we're only drawing 40 watts overall uh 0.4 amps um and we'll give this thing a little bit of a of a test but uh, but that's it that is the that is the amp fully serviced we'll get one last look at it and i was able to clean it out and keep that little uh, loopy signature in there which is nice to have so Thank mm -hmm. you.
Okay, so that will do it for this uh, 1959 Champ. Uh, I think it came out pretty cool. I mean, the like the last one I did, the chassis came out uh, fairly clean. This one's not quite as clean as the last one. It does have a little bit of pitting, but it's not bad. I replaced the handle. Also dug up a 12AX7 uh, RCA from my stash that is from the same era. And it act actually added a lot more top end sparkle. So anyway, that'll do it for this video. Hope you've enjoyed. Hit subscribe down below. And for now, we'll see y'all later.